As we left off the last time we were looking at this first sounding, uh, we discussed the model, we discussed the formation of a rough interpretation, how do we get our starting model, we were using inflection points um, and asymptotic, kind of a you know, very rough estimation of asymptotic uh, convergence. And uh, you can see that we got into the ballpark pretty good. We got 8.3% error. So IX1D is going to help us improve the fit, minimize the error between calculations and observation. So uh, don't forget to make good use of your starting data to put this in the context of the local geological environment. That's a pretty essential first step to getting a reasonable uh, result from your modeling process. So, uh, Also, don't forget that you can download a demo version of the IX1D program at uh, interpex.com. And so if you just go to this site, you'll see a window with, uh, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of software available through Interpex. Uh, scroll down on this window and click on the shareware products link down here. And on the next window that comes up, um, you'll see an image here. You'll have to scroll down to get this, to get to this area. Click on this image, the IX1DV2 model window, and another uh, screen will come up and you would uh, scroll down to the IX1DV2 download. So um, this is the version of the program that I'm using. This um, uh, is, well, you know, check out all the software and see what you might be able to use and what might be relevant to your particular interest. But um, certainly you can go through some of the exercises that we're doing if you download the IX1DV2. And of course, um, installation will depend on your operating system. So. Just as a reminder, the first sounding, we do have the drill hole data on either side of the sounding, so we know that they're in this thin veneer up here on the log scale down to about four meters. It's, it's very compressed. Um, we just have some gray clays and yellow clays, maybe a tiny little gravel in here and could have a very high resistivity. We don't know. It just kind of shows up as a bump. And we didn't model it very well. Uh, we do have the high resistivity freshwater gravel. We do have the sand and clay down here. And then we have the limestone bedrock over here. We do not have that deeper drift fill, um, aquifer drift fill gravel that uh, is of interest in this area. But uh, we do have a nice extensive shallow high resistivity freshwater aquifer. About a hundred ohm meter resistivity. Very potable. Our rough interpretation again should make sense in terms of the local geology. So use the background information that you have. Make sure that it's consistent with the that the model that you develop, the starting model, bears some semblance to what you might expect to see in the area. And we've pretty much ensured that it does over here. So we're going to be working with IX1D. Uh, Frolic, of course, is interested in these deeper gravel aquifers. Uh, we're over here. Uh, we'll see a shallow uh, aquifer here. And uh, there are no indications of the drift uh, fill gravels in this particular area. We're um, seeing a very nice high resistivity shallow aquifer, which certainly it, it, it appears that it could be rather extensive across the uh, area to the, to the north. So if we just take another look, uh, you know, just as another reminder of how the observational data, that's these data points over here, relate to the model and what we know about the local geology. This is the model window over here. We have resistivity depth on this axis, we have AB over 2, spacing on this axis, it's not depth. And then we have the apparent resistivity over here. 
uh, with the resistivities on a log scale, it's, you know, we're out to 100 here. We're at 10 over here. And these are shallow gray and yellow clays. We have the high resistivity freshwater aquifer. We have the sandy clay zone. And then we have the limestone bedrock. So hopefully you're beginning to make a connection between these two data sets. Um, the interpretation of this data set here led to this initial starting model. And we're going to go from there. We're going to take a look at the model in IX1D. <clears throat> so here we are in IX1D. And, you know, there, there are... Uh, several drop-down windows up here. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give you a complete tour of the uh, data. We're just going to go into the model window. And look, this is the, the basic model that we came up with the other day. It's the model that you see here. Uh, we've got the resistivities 2332, 2381, 49, 58 down at the bottom. And these are the uh, thicknesses. These are the depths. The depths that we came up with, we came up with these depths by taking the inflection points and dividing by two. <clears throat> and we already did a forward calculation. So I don't, that's what this line represents. And uh, so we don't need to do another one of those. I'm going to get out of this. And then I'm going to do a single inversion and you'll notice that this button now lights up. You'll notice that we have about 5% error. This is the analyze equivalence function that we have in IX1D. We use this for train conductivity. And remember what it does is it provides you with a kind of the range of possible models, all of which will give you about the same amount of uh, error, in this case about 5%. So if we click on this, we can see that, wow, those resistivities are all over the place. So uh, the depths are quite variable. Uh, the resistivities for this uh, uh, freshwater gravel that we've located in the near surface uh, extend from perhaps around 60 up to around 150, uh, so 125, 126. Uh, we can read that off down here. And this sandy silt, the sandy clay interval, about 16 to perhaps uh, uh, 70. And then over here we have uh, 70 ohmmeters to less than 50. So quite a bit of variability, but when you're doing this sort of exercise here, the best thing to do is to restrict some of your variables to keep the keep the modeling software from changing. So let's say that we're comfortable with these two resistivities here, but we're going to let this resistivity, we're going to let these res resistivities vary. And we're also, um, we're also going to, fix, uh, let's say, the depths. Let's say we're pretty sure about the depths. And this is just a rough, rough example. You know, you could, there are lots of different combinations of ways, depending on what, what it is that you want to test, that you could restrict the variables that you, you uh, want to fix and free. So we're going to let these resistivities vary. We're going to let this depth vary. And we're going to uh, see, see, what, see what happens. So we'll do a forward computation. We'll come out here. Um, let's do, uh, let's, well, let's see what happens here. I, I haven't tried this. Uh, I've got to do an inversion. It'll, it'll tell you, you know, if you, so we'll do another inversion. We see we have a little bit better fit. We're down to about 4.5% error. Let's take a look at the analyze equivalence now. And um, of course you can see that uh, by restricting the, by fixing some of the variables, you know, the resistivities of the upper two layers, um, and then just just letting the, if we, if we let this depth vary, then we, we uh, can 
you know, as we did, we, this was the only depth that could vary. We, we allowed these resistivities to vary. That um, the depth range to the top goes from about 2 to, uh, or rather, 3 to 4 meters. And uh, we didn't allow the depths to the base to vary. You can see that there's some variability here in the resistivity going out to over uh, 200 or out over 100 and to probably a little bit less than 90. We could come back to our model and uh, let's say not fix those depths. And uh, <coughs> click OK. We'll do another inversion. We'll take a look at the and of course you can see we get a lot more variability when we allow these depths to vary. So uh, if you consider this part of the model, fairly, you're fairly confident in it, but you aren't sure about the depth to the top of this freshwater gravel, then you know there are any number of ways. The point is that you can get in there, you can play around with it, uh, and uh, consider possible scenarios. So uh, we can see that the resistivity and the thickness of this near surface fr freshwater gravel go from something close to about 7 meters up to something close to about 10 meters. And uh, so quite a bit of variability. Now, the last thing that we're going to do, and we're just, this is just really kind of a brief tour, is that we can continue to do inversions. And you'll see the error drop. Uh, we can do multiple inversions and, and so on. We get to a point where we really can't gain any additional reduction in the percent error. And so the particular model that we came up with was only one out of the many possibilities that you just saw when we did the analyze equivalents. We could have a... Uh, now, now this resistivity look, uh, appears to be much higher than Froehlich tells us that it should be. So perhaps the model is actually thicker. So you have to keep the background information in mind when you come up with your final reason, your, your final model. So we're getting something here that, that, that doesn't seem to be in, observed in the area, that really high resistivity there. And we're up over, we're up close to about 200 ohm meters here, so not very consistent with the local geology. So you might want to pull that back to 100, maybe do some additional uh, additional inversions and um, and so on. It looks like the program just froze up on me, but that gives you um, that gives you a, a good idea of, um, of what uh, what you can expect to uh, run into when you're going through the modeling uh, modeling exercise. And then of course we could do an additional inversion, look at analyze equivalents again. And, Maybe you'd want to set your resistivities at particular values that you see here in the equivalent solutions. Um, but this resistivity here is too high. This resistivity is a little bit more consistent with what we see in the area. So we'd probably settle, we'd probably kind of converge on a solution that would give us a thicker, uh, shallow freshwater gravel aquifer. Uh, we also would want to move this down to about 30 meters or so just to be consistent with the uh, nearby uh, borehole data and then go through this inversion process uh, again. So uh, you can see that it does, you know, it does, does take some time to play around with. We need to be consistent with the local geology. So uh, you can always go back to your model and fix and free parameters once you kind of converge on a solution for the thickness of the aquifer, the resistivity of the aquifer and its thickness, then maybe you want to play around with this depth here. Uh, <clears throat> because it is a fairly low resistivity contrast, we could force in a depth here. Let's just say it's 32 uh, meters, do a forward calculation. and You see that the percent error really didn't uh, vary that much, uh, you might want to come back in here and fix that depth and uh, go through the uh, inversion process again. And uh, since we fixed that depth, now we have a range of thicknesses and resistivities again. The program likes to bring the resistivity of that shallow freshwater gravel 
out to a fairly high value. So I would argue against that. But, uh, so uh, let's uh, wrap up. And uh, we've taken a look at IX1D. We, we see that we have um, uh, a lot of flexibility in what we can do with the program. The idea is to remain consistent with the geology, keep the bedrock down there where it should be. Um, and don't lose sight of the fact that we do have this adjacent drill hole data to play around with and to help us constrain our model. In other soundings you may not, but then you'll learn a lot by doing the one where you have a lot of control on it, seeing what kind of variability you get, what kind of limitations you might run into. Well, uh, we've run on uh, a little bit, a little bit longer than I, I wanted to, but uh, there's, there are a lot of things to do in here and we could spend a lot of time on this. And, I suggest that you download the uh, program and, and um, uh, give it a try. So um, thanks for joining us, and we'll uh, talk to you.